Okay, today we're on the uh, famous Derbyshire Y, obviously in, in Derbyshire. Fingers crossed, we'll see some Mayfly today. Well, certainly from my perspective, when I, I was growing up, it's one of the first sort of major flies that you become aware of. Even as a kid, I can remember watching Out of Town, I think it was, with Jack Hargreaves. And there was a programme on Sunday afternoon, it used to be, uh, and it featured the mayfly hatch. It, it was just crazy just to see fish coming up for these large upwing flies. And they're totally unmistakable. Anybody with a limited amount of uh, entomology skills can recognise mayfly. We know it as Duffer's Fortnight, of course, because apparently all the fish come out and start feeding and throw caution to the wind. And yes, there are periods when, it, when the fishing can be sort of bewilderingly easy, but by the same token, there are periods when trout get very, very selective. Traditionally for me, it wasn't that exciting because I hail from rivers that are what are termed uh, rain-fed or freestone rivers where mayfly really aren't a dominant sort of uh, species. However, over time and being uh, able to go and fish on the chalk streams and places like the Derbyshire Wye here, they've become quite a feature or quite a, an event in my calendar. Nowadays up north, digressing a little bit, we're seeing uh, a change in habitat, create silt being flushed into the rivers, unfortunately, and this creates the perfect sort of environment for mayfly nymphs, which we know as silt burrowers, if you like. So, so they're now, we're, we're very aware of them. In fact, just the other day, uh, we had a tremendous hatch of mayfly up in Cumbria. So the life cycle for the mayfly is, is uh, pretty easy, like all upwing species. From the egg stage, the spinner coming back, and I'll mention the spinner uh, at the end. The spinner, female spinner comes back, deposits the eggs on the surface, they then sink to the bottom or glue to weed, various other debris in the, in, in the stream. The eggs hatch out into, into the tiny nymphs and these nymphs actually grow. And very much like um, spiders and other creatures like that, they, they molt. These are called instars, I-N-S-T-A-R, where they go through this molt stage and consequently grow. There's a little bit of uncertainty on whether the nymphs actually have a one-year cycle or two-year cycles, and I think both of those occur dependent on temperatures, water conditions, and a given environment. So you can get some nymphs developing after one year from the egg and then emerging, and others it takes two years. So the nymphs grow until they're ripe, and then they ascend to the surface, swim to the surface, got a lovely articulated swimming motion, they then emerge into what is called the submargo, or we call the dun. If you can understand that in northern speak, down south I think you folks would refer to it as the dan. We call it the dun, and then the dun flies off, transforms into the imago, sexually mature uh, mayfly, and then they gather together and have this great mass mating uh, experience, and then the females return to the water to lay the eggs. I mentioned the spinners earlier. So they actually deposit their eggs right in the middle of the stream, not, not along the banks like some upwing species or on, on uh, debris or bridge stanchions, but actually in the stream. So from a trout's point of view, that's great because the females deposit their eggs. They then sadly die and present themselves to the trout drifting down the river. So it's a win-win for the trout and us as fisher folk as well. Ideally, up, upwing flies, or most insects, like to hatch at, at lowest light levels. So cloudy days, rainy days, we'll expand on that in a moment. Reason being is they're less susceptible to aerial predators like swift swallows, black-headed gulls. So if, if, if there's cloud, the light's a bit more obscure if it's raining, that's the best hatch conditions on paper, if you like. 
Uh, however, you can get bright sunny days and we've kind of got one of them days today, so we're still hoping for Mayfly. I think what happens when you get these I perceived ideal conditions, Mayfly will hatch off in abundance, but let's assume we get several sunny days in a row and ripe nymphs will want to want to emerge and consequently there'll come a time where they decide that look we've got to go now and this can happen i've seen it with march brown olive upright and obviously what we're talking about today uh, mayflies the other plus point of the sort of more cloudy days and the wet days is the actual duns sit on the surface for longer because it takes them far longer to actually harden the wings i use the word harden because a lot of people uh, understand that they're drying the wings. They're not actually drying the wings because remember in the nymphal stage, the, the wings are malleable. They've got to be to, to pull themselves out of the nymphal shock. Then they extend the wings with this body fluid and the, the wings are floppy. If they're too floppy, the insect can't take to the air. So the wings actually harden before they can fly off. And that process takes a little bit longer. Broke my train of thought there. Mayfly Dunn's just flown off. So um, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, that process of the wings hardening takes a little bit longer when you've got uh, colder or wetter conditions and again the, 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 the uh, newly merged adult will be sat on the surface for that bit longer presenting themselves to the trout of course. The obvious one uh, is, is uh, Ephemeroptera danica, we've also got Vulgata, another species which is more present on locks and lakes and then we've got uh, Ephemeroptera linata which is what one of the rarer ones as far as i'm concerned i've never actually seen one of those apparently they're in wee pockets in the south but by by and far the most common one is danica now the window is yeah we call it mayfly as i said but uh, principally the last couple of weeks of may is when we see them but it, there is an overlap into june and many people myself included have often said tongue-in-cheek they should be called the June fly rather than the May fly. Further north you go as well, the hatches will be later in the year. For example, uh, up, up in the far reaches of Scotland where you, where you get May fly, the hatch won't have even started. Here we are, it's the back end of May now and it's in full swing in Derbyshire. Yeah, so making most of the hatch, I suppose, depends where you are. I mean, a lot of people will fish the nymph prior to the hatch. I, because it's such a celebrated hatch and we're expecting a lot of rising fish, I tend to hold off myself until fly start hatching, which again is, is weather dependent. It can be early as 11 o'clock in the morning, but consequently it can get pushed back to four o'clock in the afternoon. Initially I'll fish an emerger, especially in, on the first few days because mayfly, well, they are a large insect. Hopefully we'll catch some later and we'll have a look at those and trout can be a little bit intimidated in those early days so I'll fish an emerger pattern uh, and the beauty about emergers is they're half in half out of the surface so it's easier for trout to intercept them however when they when the fish do get a taste for, for the winged adult in its full form they uh, they're quite eager to eat them and in fact they'll almost sometimes chase them and you see trout leaping out of the water it's very exciting obviously we'll switch to uh, a done pattern and then as evening time comes and fingers cross again because spinner falls are very very unpredictable to sort of pin down or to predict when they might occur you can get what is deemed the perfect evening light winds warm and you don't see a mayfly spinner consequently you can get a, a blustery evening it's a wee bit chilly and mayfly spinners fill the air and Thereafter, you know, you're rubbing your hands together, together, they're dropping on the surface and egg laying, and you, you're getting trout feeding on those. So, ideally, I'd arm myself with, with an emerger pattern, uh, a dun pattern, and a spinner pattern, and fish through the day. For me as well, it's important. People think, you know, fish hard all day long. I, I'm a big believer in taking regular breaks, you know, keep, keep yourself, your mind, and your body fresh. Some of the common mistakes at mayfly time, uh, uh, obvious when a hatch is in full swing, there can be several fish rising. And rather than targeting one fish, people think it's a bit of a turkey shoot and the casting to one fish there, suddenly another rise. That's not what I would term a measured approach. I, I single one fish out, work on that fish to a conclusion, whether that's you, you spook the fish, 
the fish eats the fly and it's successful, you land it or it, it takes the fly and sadly you lose it. But I'll always work a fish to a conclusion before moving on to another. The measured approach means you've got a given length of line out and you can replicate that every time and be more accurate with your casting. Another common mistake is uh, using too fine a tippet. This is very, very, I see this all the time. Something I fell foul of in my uh, formative years as well. We were all sort of brought up uh, on a diet of going ultra fine tippets, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the fish don't see the tippet. First of all, fish don't see the tippet regardless of, of if it's ultra fine or it's a little bit heavier. What that does, how that affects the fly, fine tippets for small flies because a finer tippet allows a smaller fly a greater degree of freedom. However, with mayflies, you'll appreciate the quite bushy creations quite large and not as aerodynamic consequently they take a little bit more turning over so we can step up in tippet size typically to uh, something like 4x even 3x 4x is approximately six pound breaking strain 3x is approximately eight pound breaking strain now in terms of river fishing that might sound quite heavy or thick for some people however it, it just helps support the mayfly and it turns over and don't be too concerned about the fly not behaving correctly because you've got a much larger fly on now um, so it still has that freedom to move and converse with the currents finally I guess what one of the other real common mistakes is lifting into the fish too soon obviously a lot of us myself included uh, sort of taught or the reaction is as soon as you see a fish move to the fly you tighten you can be a little bit too quick with mayfly because it's a much bigger insect and especially when the spinners are on the water the trout knows they're not about to fly off so they come with a more languid rise form nice and slow he, let's imagine this is the surface fish comes up nice and slow and you see this rise you've got to wait for the head to turn down so you know it's closed the fish has closed the mouth and then you can tighten so that old old aged phrase god save the queen is quite appropriate now you can give it i would say approximately two seconds in terms of setup for my dry fly fishing i like a, a 10 foot four weight is my sort of go-to for for uk fishing that said if you're fishing an overgrown stream it might be an eight foot rod so you can get move the rod freely under under the tree line the leader doesn't need to be too long. I, I, I do prefer longer leaders and that's not me sort of puffing my chest out and say, look at me, I can fish long leaders. What you've got to remember is leaders are appreciably thinner in diameter than your fly line. So let's assume we're making a cast of 40 feet. If we've got a 20 foot leader, we've only got 20 foot of fly line out. So there's less tell from surface currents um, on the fly line. If we've only got a 10 foot leader, we've got 30 foot of fly line out on the very same cast and being appreciably thicker and more surface area there's more tell from the current so drag sets in that little bit quicker however when it comes to mayfly fishing you don't necessarily need long leaders as we discussed earlier tippet diameter needs to be a little bit thicker and obviously longer leaders sometimes see the fly just struggle to turn over not that we want exact straight line true turnover sometimes we want the fly to flail down with the leader like this to create a series of wiggles so again it just adds to this movement of a fly it's allowed to conform with the current as a starting point i would say 12 to 14 feet sometimes i might extend it to 16 feet let's have a look i was fishing my fly the other day let's have a look on here i've got a 10 foot rod so i've got approximately 10 foot i'd say i'm about 13 and a half 14 foot leader there uh, just now I've discussed before I think on on these tutorials you know um, how many fly boxes do you do, do you carry around um, and, and I'm the world's worst you know you, you could argue a lot of the time I just fish out of my fly patch here I'm looking down you folks won't see that and that that does me for the bulk of the season uh, but but for mayfly time obviously we've got some of the fully mill flies here uh, in the in the range and we, we've we've got a nymph where nymphs are allowed we've got the active done we've got the still borns duns and we've got spinners as well so there's quite quite a range what the, the key patterns are the emerger 
the active done, the still bond done, and the spinner, twinkle spinner. So principally four, four patterns there. You can extend that with the Comparadun emerger, and obviously you've got the active done here with CDC, which is a great fly when the fish are really honed in onto mayflies. What you've got to remember with mayflies is that there is a little bit of discrepancy in size. The, the females are a third larger than the males. So consequently, the males are smaller. We could probably Im imitate them on a size 10 hook. We might have to step up to a size eight for the females. 12 is a good sort of starting point, especially in the early days of the hatch when the trout are just building up confidence, but you'll soon find yourself stepping up to a size 10 and where it's allowed a size eight as well.